So today we were shut down for COVID. So uh, very excited to get back into this. Uh, we're inspired by this painting here called The Death of Virginia. And uh, this piece is part of a show called From the Vault. And it is a show that we curated out of
because all of his supporters were in the form as well and they were threatening, by, threatening violence. So she was able to go home and wait for the return of her father. And so the father comes back, but in his plan, he decides that he's not even going to hear what he has to say. And so he declares that Virginia is uh, actually the former slave of Marcus Claudius. And at that point, declares also to everybody in the forum, um, everybody in the forum that uh, he accuses everybody in the forum of sedition. So trying to create this uproar against, you know, the established government and politics at the time. So instead of uh, being accused of sedation and incurring violence, the people in the crowd disperse. At this point, the father, this is, this is here, uh, Virginius. He is absolutely distraught and he begs Claudius to um, interview his daughter himself and, you know, hear what she has to say. So Claudius agrees, but in that moment, Virginius takes a knife and stabs his daughter. He does this because it's the only way that he feels he can uphold her virtue and her freedom. So he kills her before she becomes a slave. At this point, uh, Virginius and Asilius are being arrested uh, by the lifters, so the, the senator, or the, the, um, the civil servants that are serving Aetius. But the crowd hears about this, they all come back, and then they uh, kill all of the lecters, and this actually, this actually causes the fall of the Decemberi and the reinstate, the reestablishment of the Roman Republic. So that term, Decemberi? Decemberi. I've never heard of it. I've heard of the Senate in, the, in terms of ancient Rome, but so I've never heard of Decemberi. It's, it's in ancient Rome, and it's basically the appointment of these 10 people. Yeah. And they were the ones that were coming up with their system of laws, so their policies, and don't do this and do that. And then they were approved by the Senate. Okay. But the Senate actually, they actually had absolute power. They were the group that made the laws, but the Senate still approved them, and they didn't have a choice to approve them. Oh. And that's why they become, they become actually quite corrupt, is because they had absolute power. So the only way to overthrow them is to basically destroy them. So this is the incident that actually causes the fall of the Decemberi and the, the establishment, the reestablishment of the um, of the Roman Republic. So it's quite a popular story um, in in the Renaissance. So there are other artists that have painted this piece. I'll tell you, there's two that I found here: Gabriel Francois Doyen and Guillaume Guillaume Letaille. Um, they painted it, but the one that we have here is done in the style of Francesca de Mira. And I say it's done in the style of because it's not the actual painting. There is a painting of this piece to the exact size, the real one, in the Art Gallery of Manchester here. Huh. Then we're like, oh, what is this that we have here? You know, is this what we would call a forgery? But there's some technicality. Um, and one of this is that it's not signed, and so we can, it can be argued that it's not a forgery because it's not pretending to be the painting by the Mira, even though it's painted pretty much exactly like him, uh, it's not pretending to be the actual piece. So there have been some really interesting court cases, we will be doing some more Art for Lunch talks, uh, just on the subject of forgery, because it's actually a very fascinating topic. Um, and there's a lot of nuance to be argued and discussed in there, and some pretty savvy, uh, some pretty savvy figures people with it. So then, what is it doing in Canard? We have a piece that's done in the style of Francesco de Mira, down to the exact size. <coughs> what is it doing here? And when did it come here? So actually, the provenance of this piece is not complete. We know that it was hanging in the Canarita Hotel, and that hotel, um, used to have quite a few beautiful pieces of artwork, and some of them were given by different families, not that the hotel themselves acquired all of them. This may have been one of them that the Canrecha, the owners actually acquired at the time that it was built, but we don't know that for sure. And even still, why is there this piece that's obviously for 
pretending to be the real thing and yet not the real thing, and not necessarily saying that it was the real thing. So we're going to say at the turn of the uh, 20th century, early 20th century, late 19th century, there were a lot of Saudi art dealers in Europe. And so what they would do is they commissioned other artists to paint paintings like this. Beautiful, classical styled artworks. They would roll them up and they would come to North America and sell them to predominantly very wealthy families that wanted to have beautiful, opulent pieces of work in their home. It was quite a trend, it was extremely common. And so I don't know, and we're still researching, whether this piece um, was a wealthy family here that acquired the work maybe from further east, whether uh, I would think especially Montreal, and then um, whether or not it was acquired directly from a gallery uh, in Montreal by, by the hotel or not. Again, did somebody move here with this piece as a, as a descendant and then donated it? They were still doing some research on it. But it's very reflective of a time when uh, Saudi art dealers were creating these works and selling them. Uh, they put them in these beautiful frames. It looked like a real thing. There was no internet at the time. I was not present for the sales pitch to know whether or not somebody <laughs> was saying that it was the real deal. But it may not have mattered to those that were just impressed by it and wanted to impress their peers. So this is the story that we have here um, about this particular piece, one of many in this show. Does anybody have any questions? What, okay, so that looks like a water tower in the back. To me, I've never seen that classical architectural form, that massive cylinder. <coughs> he did another painting that was similar to this. I am not overly familiar with the architecture. He was very popular and worked predominantly in Naples and in Turin. So I don't know if this piece here is reflective of something that they would have had in ancient Rome that no longer exists. I don't know what sort of structure that would be either, whether it's some sort of, has a military purpose or some other purpose, it obviously is a tower of yeah. some sort, but without any windows, I'm not sure what, it, what its purpose would be. And you're right, I haven't seen that in a lot of classical paintings either. But it is something that, you know, if somebody had a good amount of time, they could probably. Could you talk about composition of it? Well, in terms of composition, there's a lot of, of Baroque pieces. There's always a, a dramatic sense of light. Again, we're talking about trying to incite emotion. And also there's a lot of uh, lines of force guiding the eye. So you'll see that it's framed well, these columns here. This line here can echo this line here. We also have that the source of light is coming from here. So in terms of composition, there's not too, too much distracting in the foreground. Um, but uh, it's, with a lot of works, it's a lot of guiding the eye towards the drama in the sort of chiaroscura style of very dark uh, versus very light shadowing to create that sort of dramatic, more drama to the piece. Baroque is very dramatic and is often very dark and very light. And even with the palettes, um, once you get to do research about different periods in art, the palette and the different colors are often uh, similar. So in Baroque, they actually use the face of a alizarin crimson, which is almost a, um, a purplish red mm -hmm. on the base of a lot of their works. Hmm. On the underpainting? On the underpainting and the, the layers. So you'd say that the focal point is kind of off-center in a way, um, because there's a column and the, the claudia is just pointing. Yeah. And then it goes from there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Now I think because we've got two different elements here, we've got a drama coming this way, and then we've got this drama coming this way, she's yeah. the central figure. This piece here is oil. Uh, the original one would have been probably at more of a, he, he did quite a few frescoes. There is some, it might have been more of a tempera piece, and that's where they build up the layers. Um, this piece has suffered, uh, <laughs> suffered a little bit over time. It has been restored to the best of its capacity. 
Um, so the, what, the original one would be much more luminous than this. And you would see even a lot more. There's reds and blues and a lot of the shadows. But being careful, it, it can reach a people smoke, uh, uh, cigarette smoke, and even fireplace smoke are some of the some of the worst things that you can do to a painting. They can be removed depending on the quality of the varnish, um, and depending on humidity and such too. So this this one, uh, as I said, has been restricted to the best of its capacity. Um, but uh, the original one is uh, is much more luminous than this one. But again, a very classical story. Uh, that's used often um, during the Renaissance, they would refer back to a lot of these classical stories as subject matter. Was there anything on the back of it, Sophie, that gave you any clues? No. And that's part, part of it, right? Yeah. It's not the real deal. Yeah. So it's it's somebody that has a good, a good business idea and is getting some artists to paint it. It was never put on a stretcher. Or if it was, it was cut off the stretcher and put on another one here. So when you research a painting, yes, look on the back. Oftentimes there might be a, a piece of paper, but that's just a dust jacket. Um, and then you could also you check the labels of the frame, the framing, uh, or the gallery. So some galleries would do all their own framing, and that's how you trace back provenance. You're like, oh, this gallery was very well renowned. Um, or if it was from a certain artist's studio going back, an artist's studio might have actually had a stamp, and they would stamp uh, in ink on the back of the canvas. So uh, Gaumio would, back used to even still do that. And so you can trace back authenticity that way. Uh, the other thing, too, is if you have the original frame, then you can do some research about the error, because the different techniques of framing uh, give clues to the different error, and even the different region. This one here. Um, we don't have any clues, unfortunately, on the back of it. So actually, what was neat in our research is that the museum records showed that it was uh, restored by restorer in the style of this artist. And it was thought maybe um, that it was more leading to a, a massacre of the influence, a massacre of the innocence sort of influence. But I know massacre of the innocence, and I disagree with that. <laughs> and, uh, but knowing the style, the, the restorer absolutely knew which artist it was. She said it was in the style of this Francesca de Mira. So now, the records, which the restoration happened back in the 80s, when the internet wasn't in everybody's computer, if you had a computer. And so now we have this. And so I started doing research on Francesca de Mira, and then I saw our painting. I was like, oh, there it is. What's, what's this one called? And then it was Death of Virginia, and then learning more about that actual story was. So it was kind of neat that we were able to uh, further the research in the real story of this painting here. So he has, uh, there was a book, uh, there is one retrospective exhibition that happened down in the States. And so we're looking to acquire that book for our art library so that people can learn a little bit more about him and specifically this sort of Renaissance style of painting. Because his artwork is all across the globe in major institutions. They don't come available very often in auction. So if they're not, if they're privately held, it's in a family that's held them for a long time, and it's not, uh, it's not passing them on. So we still have a few answers to try and solve with this one. Um, it'll be a bit of a challenge to take it further than we have it now in terms of provenance, but uh, we'll see what we can do. Or 10 minutes if you want to go more. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> I talk too fast. <laughs> the best of the story of this piece, as I said, the original one is from 1890. Uh, very unique, as I said, reflective of the time period. 
um, in which these these copies were done. That was one of the most fascinating things for me. Is that uh, it, it really reflects a, a time of uh, savviness for dealers and opulence, and when people also couldn't necessarily check back and see whether something was done somewhere else. Um, we are very much a global and connected now. That this this would never this would never happen anymore. So did the Kenrisha owners give this to the city? Is that what they did? Uh, they gave it to the Lake Village Museum. There's actually quite a few pieces here that came out of the Kenrisha uh, when it was no longer serving um, as as the hotel and with the with the restaurant and the different shops. So um, there's a few here that are coming to meet municipal offices, but then at the same time there's a number that are directly from the from the hotel. Uh, and there's even a, a few pieces hanging in the Lake Village. Artesia wooden piece that was uh, created by a, a German prisoner of war, and that was 